Good evening and assalamu alaikum. So I'm going to cover a topic that's uh, hot in the news. If you are following the news constantly, I know that we have a Muslim president in the White House. Uh, uh, and uh, this is no coincidence because there's considerable resources that has been spent uh, to try to make a link between Obama uh, and not only uh, the Muslim world, but even the extremist parts of the Muslim world. Uh, and after I finish my presentation, at least we'll understand where uh, some of this constant barrage of Islamophobic content uh, is coming from. Uh, who are the uh, producers of uh, Islamophobia in our country? Who are the spokespersons uh, for Islamophobia? And also to understand its entanglement with the question of Palestine, uh, important as it is. Now, first let me just say what we call the media pillars of Islam. And if you just look at any coverage of Islam in the media, you'll have these five lenses that Islam and Muslims are presented. 9-11 uh, as an organizing frame for understanding Islam and Muslims. So you ha all have to repeat it almost every news piece. Uh, violence, terrorism, and fundamentalism. Uh, so the news piece has to have some parts of that. Veiling and Islamic patriarchy. And this is often is being spoken by men, right? Who are the epitome of patriarchy in our own society. And you would think that they're actually members of now, but they're not. Uh, <laughs> This delineation of Islam and the West as a, as, a, as a geography, so you have constantly, we do this, this is what Islam is, and this is what the West is. And then Middle East, and when we say the Middle East is actually Israel, Palestine, everything is irrelevant uh, as far as the news. So what is good for Israel, it's uh, something that we focus on, and everything of 350 million people or 1.2 billion people is essentially almost covered as a footnote not only to history, but also to discourses. Now, what is Islamophobia? Right. Uh, Islamophobia is a closed-minded prejudice against uh, or hatred of Islam and Muslims. Right. Closed-minded prejudice against or hatred of Islam and Muslims. And Islamophobia is an individual who holds a closed-minded view of Islam and promotes prejudice against or hatred of Muslims. Now, it is not appropriate for us to label or even call majority of those who question in Islam and Muslims as Islamophobes. Right? For example, questioning, let's say, policies that are carried out by Saudi Arabia. It's a legitimate question. I have questions. To question about what Mubarak did. He was our ally. That's not Islamophobic. To question certain processes and procedures. What we are saying is that always whenever you say Islam and Muslim, there's a problematizing of Islam and Muslims. And this is, I think, if you read Edward Said, Orientalism, you'll understand at least how that process is not new, but rather in the current period, it has been more sharpened. Uh, what interests are served by Islamophobia in, in the present? Uh, one, Israel advocates. Uh, Israel advocates are utilizing Islamophobia uh, in our country. Uh, Right-wing clash of civilization advocates. It's clash of civilization, Samuel Huntington, Bernard Lewis, and others, and now it's like a major uh, piece within European discourse about the clash of civilization. Uh, actually, I was very happy when Huntington wrote his book about who we are because he attacked the Latinos. I said thank you very much because it's actually created an alliance for me with 40 million Latinos in this country. <laughs> right? So don't underestimate their misperception because when they look at the mirror, they only see themselves, they don't see anybody else. Uh, so the advocates of clash of civilization, military industrial complex. Did anybody uh, hear about the peace dividend when the Soviet Union collapsed? Yeah. I'm trying to look for it. I went to the bank to cash it, right? <laughs> uh, it is gone. Uh, military industrial complex needs an enemy, and therefore an enemy needs to be cast. And in here, Islam, Muslims, and so on are the new enemy where we could produce weapons more so uh, to, maintain, to maintain our military industrial complex. Anti immigrant groups. Uh, in Europe and in the United States, use Islamophobia as the pretext. For example, when we say that we need to secure our borders because we're fearful of terrorists coming from Mexico. <laughs> now, and I, sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll be slow, but let me go through this. Most of the Arab world and the Muslim world have been colonized either by the French or the British, meaning no habla no espanol. 
<laughs> so if you want to plan a terrorist attack, and I'm not saying you are, to go to Mexico, you're going to have a two-year language program because, before you find your way to the north. If you want to actually come in the U.S. for terrorist action from outside, Canada is much easier. And they're actually, they give you the variety. If you speak French, you go to the French areas. If you speak English, you go to the English areas. And that's why Islamophobia becomes a vehicle actually to target and deal with our internal dynamics relative to the immigration. What issue for elections? And increasingly, Islamophobia is being mobilized as an election issue, right, with uh, the creeping Sharia laws that are being promoted. Uh, and politicians are very skilled in trying to use wedge issues. We use it in California in Proposition 187, 209, 208. And these wedge issues are used as a way to try to uh, get the base out to the ballot box, get the independents to sway away to your side, and shave a few, few percentage points from the Democratic side. So the uh, wedge issue right now is being deployed by uh, the Republican. And I say the Republicans have a major Islamophobic problem in their hand, <laughs> in particular also with the Tea Party. Arab are author authoritarian regimes, right? I want to be equal opportunity. I'm not leaving the Arabs or the Muslims out. Do you notice when Mubarak was in trouble, all of a sudden he's saying that it's Al-Qaeda that is uh, going to take over the country. Similarly, when Qaddafi got in trouble, he raised the card that Al-Qaeda is taken. Now Bashar al-Assad is saying Al-Qaeda is coming to take over. Uh, and as such, Arab regimes will use Islamophobia to rationalize their own existence and their own regimes. Who is producing Islamophobia in the United States? Who is producing Islamophobia uh, in the United States? Uh, Israel advocates have been the major contributors to the financing, production, distribution, and usage of Islamophobia in the American context. Time and time again, the institutional backbone of the Islamophobic production in our country has the Israel advocates' footprints all over it. And later on, we'll at least understand why uh, the Islamophobia serves the interests of those who are advocating for uh, Israel. Uh, it is actually to keep the U.S. unconditional support for Israel in a unipolar world. And this is important for us to understand Israel's role during the Cold War. Uh, Israel served a number of uh, roles for the U.S. It was Cold War strategic ally, even with the APAC functioning within, an, within a framework that sees the value of having Israel as an ally. Regional power in the Middle East. Uh, Israel is the regional power in the Middle East during the Cold War, and I would say continued after. Protect, and I put protect between two parentheses, because uh, Israel often acts on its own interests and tries to wed its own interests to U.S. and Western power interests. Uh, keep balance of power. Uh, between the uh, Soviet Union at one hand and the US, between the monarchies in the Arab world and the Arab nationalists. Uh, that's why if you think of the conflict that took place between the monarchies and Nasser uh, as a, a representative of the Arab nationalists, Israel played into the balance of power in the region. Uh, provide valuable intelligence, uh, and I think some have already <coughs> covered the role of uh, not only Iraq, but, but some of the uh, considerable intelligence information that has been gleaned uh, through the years by uh, the, uh, uh, those who were functioning on behalf of Israel. Test and develop weapons. Right? Uh, Israel actually, by receiving U.S. weapons, have tested many of the weapons, and the Palestinians, uh, as well as some of the Arab world, have become the guinea pigs for the new developments of weapons and testing that, not only in the Palestine context, but also Iraq and Afghanistan, if we think, think also of the uh, United States uh, current period in war. Post-Cold War, and the Iran post -Cold War and post also Iranian revolution, Israel recast its role to counter and prevent Islamic extremists and Arab nationalists. The Arab nationalists has been put to the side burn, and now Israel has cast itself that it's the vanguard for protecting not only the Israel, the West, and the world from Islamic extremists, reassert its strategic value in a unipolar world, speak of common threat with the West, provide training and know-how as subcontractors on the war on terrorism, expand its foreign policy reach so as to become more viable, India, China, Sub-Saharan Africa, and become, and become the go-to experts on, con on countering Islamic ideologies and movements. 
I want to pick on the provide training and know-how in subcontracting for a minute. Uh, three months ago in the Bay Area, we had uh, urban shield training. And this was uh, under the banner of the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. Uh, this is a program where they bring uh, not only police services from the U.S., but actually brought trainers and police services from across the world, Israel, uh, Jordan, Bahrain, and other agencies to train with the local police and the local services. Uh, in some of their programs in there, they actually were using Islamophobic content by actually telling some of the participants who were uh, to act as hostages to speak and say Arabic words like Allahu Akbar and so on in the training. Now, if this is not embedding Islamophobic thinking in our own local police services, so when you get the New York City Police Department setting up an intelligence surveillance network in New Jersey, it should not surprise you because the contracting and the grounding for this type of behavior has already been made at the training level, and therefore the next step would be to put it into effect. Now, institutions behind Islamophobia, all right? Any of these institutions, and many of them possibly are known for us, and some of them are not known for us, all of these Islamophobic institutions, or the majority of them, are funded by the pro-Israel advocate network, which would be connected to promoting and supporting Israel uh, in one way or the other. And if you find the type of material that's coming out of them that is targeting the Arab and Muslim community, you'll find it is systematic. Uh, it's almost about 18 uh, large institutions uh, in this country producing Islamophobia. Between the year 2001 to 2009, the amount of money that went into the Islamophobic production machinery were $42.6 million. From 2001 to 2009, by many of these institutions to create this Islamophobic crusade as uh, uh, some has labeled it, or Islamophobia, Islamophobia Incorporated as another report there are a lot of money that has been put into the pot to create this Islamophobic uh, atmosphere in our own society. Now, I investigate a project on terrorism. Who runs that project? <laughs> Stephen Emerson. Uh, Stephen Emerson, if you go to his website, I don't want to encourage people to go to his website because <laughs> it raises rating, but he has Wrote, wrote a report on almost every significant figure in the Arab and Muslim community in America, linking them in the sixth degree or, or, or sixth degree of separation in terrorism. And his research was actually some of the foundational pieces that were used in Peter King's hearing. Right? As such, so it's very important for us to know because it investigative project on terrorism, we don't see Stephen Emerson, we don't, see, we don't see Israel advocate in the United States. American Enterprise Institute, we don't need to uh, go any further. They brought us the Iraq war and possibly working on getting us into Iran. Uh, these are the individuals behind Islamophobia. These are the talking heads that you see on the news. You see them on Fox, you see them brought to speak about Islamophobia, David Horowitz, all right? uh, Stephen Emerson, Pamela Geller, and Coulter. David Yorshalimi. Does anybody know David Yorshalimi? He is, he is the one behind the campaign nationally uh, on Sharia law. So he's behind the Oklahoma Sharia law, Sharia law in many different states, and he's systematically uh, trying to uh, outlaw Sharia uh, across the country and use it also as a way to uh, sideline and uh, tarnish the uh, American Muslim community and anyone who support them. Frank Gaffney, uh, Daniel Pipes, Aubrey Shernick, and uh, many others that are on this list. Now I want to step back a little bit to the documentary obsession. How many know the document documentary obsession? Okay. This documentary uh, was actually uh, put, uh, put together in 2005, put out as a documentary. Uh, it actually compares the threat of Islam with that of Nazi, Nazi Germany before World War II and draws, on, draws parallels between Islamists and the Nazi party during the World War II. It was really put in college campuses initially and on the web 
by the pro-Israel uh, uh, activists on college campuses. And then in 2008, it was picked up and became an important piece of Islamophobia. In the 2008 election, right, if you remember, uh, Obama was attacked as being Muslim, right? Our first Muslim president. I'm just joking. Uh, but that was the attack uh, on, on, on Obama. And in a very critical period within the campaign, uh, 28 million free copies of Succession DVD were inserted in the Sunday newspaper in 70 uh, Sunday newspapers distributed in the swing states. All right? 28 million. The cost is approximately between 16 and a half to 18 million dollars. The cost of the uh, production and distribution of this DVD uh, in uh, the United States. Uh, the funding came from the Clarion Fund. Uh, which actually is, has a link to uh, a, another uh, organization that operates out of settlements in the West Bank. And as such, it was a direct attempt at influencing the uh, political outcome of the presidential election. Right? And therefore, we need to at least be aware that Islamophobia in here has a major role to play. And I say that in the fall, in the next, this coming election, Islamophobia will be used as a wedge issue in many places. And the reason for this is there's a research that was done by a uh, political scientist in Indiana University, Abdul Qadir Sinno, where in the research it says 70%, 74% of the Americans, when they asked to vote for a, a politician, 74% would not vote for an atheist. So if you're atheist running for election, it's a very, very difficult uphill. But the second group that has the highest, what you call, uh, difficulty is Muslims, registering about 64% of the American public. If they, when they ask whether they would vote for a candidate who is Muslim, they would not vote for him. Now, you could actually notice that where uh, Obama is often is being attacked as a socialist, right? and the second as a Muslim. It is not coincidental. There is research. There is focus groups. And the data shows that. This is not to celebrate Obama, because at least when we follow the New York case, uh, the funding for the surveillance for the New York Police Department came from the White House. Just these are facts that have to be uh, understood. Uh, now we have another uh, documentary, The Third Jihad, uh, which actually brought in a Muslim voice uh, to speak, uh, Dr. Jasser, uh, who's a phantom representative, does not have any uh, link to the community. But he is the voice in that. Relentless, another documentary, and then The Forgotten Refugees. These are uh, materials that are being used, once again, to constantly uh, fan the flames of Islamophobia. Now, why Islamophobia? And I think it's important for us to visit with Daniel Pipes uh, for a few minutes, uh, because he gives us such uh, intellectual nuggets uh, that we need to stop at. Uh, in a speech in 2001, he says, I worry very much from the Jewish point of view uh, that the presence and increased stature and affluence and enfranchisement of American Muslims will present true dangers uh, to American Jews. All right? So in here, he sees that uh, the presence, so he would rather not have Muslims in this country, uh, increased stature, he would rather not have them any stature uh, in this country. Affluence and enfranchisement, meaning that they actually vote. What a, what a novel uh, concept. Right? So he sees this as a problem, but another statement from him that's very important, which is in 1990, he says, Western European societies are unprepared for the massive immigration of brown-skinned peoples, cooking strange food, and maintaining different standards of hygiene. All immigrants bring exotic customs and attitudes, but Muslims' customs are more troublesome than most. <laughs> now, this is a person that was appointed by President Bush to the Peace uh, Commission <laughs> nationally. Right? I wonder what type of exotic food they serve at the inauguration ceremony for his <laughs> membership. This religion would seem to have nothing functional to offer. But more importantly for us, in 2004, as the debate post 9-11 post the invasion of Iraq takes shape in this country about holding prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, what needs to take place in our country, whether we should arrest and intern Muslim. He actually turned and says, in terms of supporting internment, yes, I do support the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II. And therefore, what we have 
as those individuals who are engaged in Islamophobia are beginning to attempt to try to rewrite some of the darkest pages of our history that the society has moved on. But in order for them to provide the context for supporting their own perspective, they're actually pulling back on, uh, on their perspective relative to the Japanese internment. M.J. Rosenberg, and I already uh, has, had him quoted, but in here he believes that uh, those who are engaging in Islamophobia from the Israel advocate perspective. He says they believe that the more acceptance there is of Muslims here at home in our own country, the less reflexive hatred there will be for Muslims abroad. And that, in their view, reduces America's sympathy for Israel. Meaning, what we want from you, the American society, is to have a reflexive hatred of Muslims. And if you have reflexive hatred of Muslims, then it will be much easier for us to support Israel policy because it's killing those people, quote unquote, that we already have reflexive hatred to them. So in this sense, what we say Islamophobia is to create that grounding for the othering of Arabs and Muslims, both in here and abroad. And since Palestinians are at the front in relations to the Israel-Palestine conflict, it becomes for us accepting Israel policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Second, he says to stoke Islamophobia and national security concerns to both the GOP in the midterm elections. And just yesterday, I was talking in my own class about the whole securitization of our own society. It's like you have cameras everywhere, right? You have police and everywhere. And it doesn't seem to be that we're safe. We're still having more people killed in our own society, more cars being broken into, more houses are being uh, robbed. And therefore, I say, what, what should be the conclusion? That each one of us will just wear a camera and to, so Big Brother can see everything that we do? And instead of having uh, a society that actually practices freedom, uh, values liberty, and does not feel that a security umbrella is what we need, rather it would be that we need an educated, well-qualified citizenry that is able to take hold of its own democracy. Uh, the 2010 election Islamophobia was deployed. We have major, the same person who actually designed the Willie Horton uh, ads uh, for uh, Bush Senior, is the same person that was brought back to design the Islamophobic spots that were promoted in the election, in the 2010 election. And we understand that the Willie Horton, basically it was a racist uh, uh, ad that was placed at the critical time that basically killed the chances of uh, Michael Dukakis in that election. Increasingly, we're seeing these spots using a particular structure of racism in order for us to influence the election. And we, I'm one that says that the 2012 election will witness the utilization of Islamophobia as well. And we need to be aware of it to counter it and not to fall into the uh, same type of methodology that has uh, shown some success. What are the goals of the Islamophobia campaign? And I will conclude with this. Demonize Islam, thus Muslims who believe in Islam are guilty, similar to how we demonize communism. So if you believe in communism, then you are guilty. Criminalize Islam through link to terrorism. Uh, isolate Muslims in American society. Marginalize Muslims in civil society. This will lead to further radicalization among the youth. Hope that radicalization re leads to violence. Actually, this methodology wants violence to take place. All right? Because violence must be responded to, thus we could rationalize our security infrastructure, we rationalize our military industrial complex, we rationalize our policy not only here, but abroad as well as with Israel. So we actually we need to say no, what you're advocating, you're advocating actually or pushing uh, for violence to manifest in our society and we need to actually stop and reverse this trend and reverse that possibility. Thank you. Good time.